Welcome to The Recovering Perfectionist, where you'll learn all the hacks you need to get started and finished on your business or project. You'll connect with successful entrepreneurs who are in perfectionist rehab, unapologetically experimenting and balancing life, business, family, and me time. I'm your host and Chief Recovering Perfectionist, Claire Barton. Hey, it's Claire from The Recovering Perfectionist. Thanks for joining me today on the show. I have got Janine Vosper uh, coming on the show today and she and I met at an amazing workshop a couple of weeks ago with Francesca Moy and Natasha Denman in an event or a workshop called Bums on Seats, which is all about um, getting people into your workshop and your meetups and all of that sort of thing. And Janine and I were chatting because she also has a podcast called We Are Women, which of course took my um, interest because it's a podcast and because it's all about women, which is kind of a good overlap with what I talk about. Um, Janine does lots of different things. She's an international trainer and she is a speaker and author um, and she talks a lot about sales, but in a really non sausage way, which we all love as well. So have a listen, love to hear your thoughts, and I will uh, get started now. Hey, everyone, it's Claire, and I have got Janine Vosper with me today. And Janine and I have uh, only known each other for about a week and a half. We met at an amazing workshop conference with Francesca Moy and Natasha Denman last week. Um, which was absolutely amazing content, but the people that I met were fantastic and Janine was one of them. So welcome on the show, Janine. It's so nice to have you here. Um, and Janine is also a fellow podcaster. She is a mastermind meetup leader. She's a coach. She's an international trainer. She's an author. She's kind of just amazing at everything. So I'm going to hand over to you, Janine, to <laughs> articulate a little bit better what it is that you do and uh, thank you very much Claire yeah I totally agree I really enjoyed our conversation at that training session those two days of training and I do agree with you there were so many people that just had so much to offer so it's uh, it's always great meeting new people with getting new ideas yes so a little bit about me I have been training um, sales teams and commission-based sales representatives for about 20 years and uh, so they achieve the best results. And when you're on commission only, as most of us solopreneurs, entrepreneurs <laughs> are, we don't sell something, we don't make money, then it's just uh, helping them truly overcome their anxiety around selling and cold calling and just feeling really comfortable with it is probably most of the training that I do. Mm. And doing that through uh, developing systems that work, not... Um, not sales scripts and not anything that feels really icky and, and salesy, but just being really authentic and building how to build relationships really. Mm -hmm. And a bit of personality profiling as well so that people can identify what type of conversation they need to have with somebody. And then importantly, working on the follow, follow up and follow through. So I've been doing that for a long time. I taught aerobics for about 10 years and I think yeah. that was my hardest sell ever was yeah, getting people right. their joggers on. You know, once they got your joggers on, they had to go to the gym and they had to do the class. Then it was okay. <laughs> and I, I used my mum used to be an aerobics instructor. I remember listening oh, really? to Jive Bunny and Master Mix, I think it was called, on vinyl, believe it or not, when she was working out her choreography for her aerobics classes. Uh, I'm not quite that old. I'm not the vinyl, okay? But, it was, <laughs> but I, I did become a fan of it during the Jane Fonda era. Naturally. I used to go to the gyms and lay out gym wear and sell it and <laughs> take orders and go back a month's time with this beautiful you know exotic leotard material oh, and it was just just great but crazy yeah, so i've been everything i've ever done in my life has been around building connections and making sales and mm. and doing it quite successfully and um, had the opportunity to present in japan and quite a few places through the us and hawaii and around australia as well on all different all topics that are associated with right from rapport building through to, you know, how do you make a sale? I love it. And I think, um, I think there's uh, a really, like it's really cool to hear of someone who's been doing it that way for so long because I feel like in my circles and my experience um, when I first started my business, I was like, oh, you know, I've got to do the, the old-fashioned traditional versions of all the things that I thought selling was. And then the more that I've sort of gotten into it, that it's just it's 
like the last thing that you do is um, a sales conversation. It is all about that connection and communication and um, authenticity, which is a completely overused word, but I totally mm. agree that it's just about um, being completely who you are and, and it's that magnetic kind of marketing rather than push marketing. So I love the fact that you've been doing it for so long and so successfully and all over the world. So I can't wait to pick your brains a little bit more about, about that. <laughs> so it's awesome. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's very different to when I first started doing it. It was very much that, you know, that high um, forceful, here's your sales script, go out and do it type of thing. And it just didn't gel with me at all. And when I first started working for a, a company that sold first aid supplies, you know, really um, honest sort of legitimate company and, and they were very much into, no, 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 just go and you know, talk about relationships as well. So they resonated with me and I still work there part-time as a sales manager 20 years later. So I do it very part-time now, which is super cool because I can run my own coaching business as well. Oh, awesome. and, and, that, and from there, I, when I started with them, I was selling about, oh, $1,000 a week if I was lucky, a couple of thousand dollars a week with a product. And then... By the time I'd finished, uh, there was only a, days a, a day a week's work, really. And so it was a couple of thousand dollars a month I was selling for them. Mm -hmm. And when I went into the management role, we split my territory four ways and I was doing over $36,000 a month. So, yeah, 35% nice. commissions. Amazing. No, it was cool. That was good. That was so good. So before we go any further, I have a little sales story of my own, actually. Um, okay. Well, a couple of them, but the one particular, so I started work when I was 14 and nine months, I worked for Best and Less. I was, you know, a, it's another long story, but I always ended up in these management positions since I was 16. I ended up doing like supervising and I was in retail for a long time. And then I was in corporate management, HR and operations, that sort of thing. But when I, I went to, um, I moved from Darwin where I had finished my high schooling. I went down to Adelaide and I went to uni for a year. And then I took a gap year, never went back, but we'll call it a gap year. <laughs> um, and I spent the first six months of that year, so that would have been 2002, working for, oh my gosh, um, a company who was contracted by APT. Remember that telephone company? I don't even know if it's around anymore. And I did business to business. So right. kind of yes. trying to convert people over from Telstra, Optus, Vodafone, whatever, onto APT. Mm -hmm. I remember getting, we used to get paid $30 for every business, $15 for every home and $25 or something for every mobile phone. Right. And it was dreadful, dreadful work. I absolutely hated almost every minute of it except for the social side of it and, you know, that sort of thing. But I remember, you know, we had so much sales training. That's all it was. It was all about sales. The only rewards were about sales. You know, you got to ring the bell or ring the gong or whatever it was. Um, if you'd made five or 10 or all of that sort of thing. Oh my gosh. <laughs> but I remember I, every time someone sells something to me, I remember this thing called gifts, I think it was, G-I-F-T-S. And it was like the five ways to try and sell people, to try and trick people into thinking it. And there was like, T was the Jones theory. So everyone on the street signed up. Why wouldn't you sign up to double APT? Like as okay. if. Yeah. Um, fear of loss. So if you don't do it now, you might not get another chance. As mm. if, you know, <laughs> whatever, yeah, all yeah. those sort of things. And I, every time it happens to me now, I still think, is Joan steering me? She's Joan <laughs> steering me. Is she Joan steering me? And I've kind yeah. of got this thing in my head. So since then, actually, before I go on further, I've still got a, I've got a friend who was working for the same company up until about three or four years ago. And apparently at that point, I still held the record for the most amount of sales in a day. Oh, wow. I was a bit yeah. lucky on my last door was a St. Vincent's de Paul and the guy who ran it ran 11 of them and he signed all of them up. So <laughs> I had a momentous day. It was absolutely fantastic and, uh, you know, all that sort of thing. The culture yeah. was cool but the sales were a bit crazy. So I... Well, well done with that. Thank you very much. Um, mm -hmm. I've particularly since then had, I guess, some real hang-ups around sales. And like I said, mm -hmm. I worked in retail um, for quite a long time so there was obviously a very big focus on sales um, in some of those companies or most of those companies. Mm -hmm. um, so now that I'm in my own business, um, it's really interesting how I like noticing my, my thought processes and that sort of thing about selling. And I know when I first started, I, I had a, a business coach and 
I, you know, she sort of said, we'll do this, these processes and we were doing um, uh, like avatar interviews. So mm-hmm. do an avatar interview, get the information a couple of weeks later, give them a session back. And then at the end say, if you want to keep working together, these are the things. And every single one, I think I did eight of them, every single one of them, I chickened out and I didn't say anything at the end. I sent them a message afterwards with something like a total excuse, like, oh, my coach will kill me if I don't send you this outline. <laughs> blame somebody else. That's <laughs> blame someone else, exactly. It's a great way to start and get over that mm-hmm. as having an excuse. But, um, but it is really interesting because now I know that probably 70% of clients who come to me are referral-based. So I know it's proof that, you know, all of that sort of thing is definitely in the communication and the connection and the people that I work with get so much value and so much connection. We have so much fun and there's so many awesome outcomes that the sales kind of take care of themselves. So it's mm. like kind of your, I mean, like part of your sort of philosophy on that as well. Yeah, absolutely. And getting that, the, the, getting the referrals is, is fabulous when you're doing something well. And what we do as entrepreneurs, it, it's, it's different when you're working, so as you gave that example of working for AAPT, is if someone said no, it wasn't you personally, you didn't take it as personally as you do when it's your own business. You, there's a lot more emotion in the, the conversation when it's yourself they're saying no to as opposed to another company. Yes, that's so true. Yeah, and that's where we get hung up on th- a lot of things, and a lot of the conversations that we have, we have them in our head. So we already go. We, we've got a story mm-hmm. that's our own personal story. You know, they they won't buy from me because I am just a single operator and I'm not like one of the big guys. They won't buy from me because I, it's too expensive. They won't buy from me because I don't have the degrees that other people have. And there's a whole lot of stories that we take in with us into a sales conversation and I call it the elephant in the room and you 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 as the as the will be sitting there thinking they're going to bring it up they're going to bring it up they're going to bring it up and so you've got this story going on in your head rather than knowing how why people will and why buy from you and how to actually broach something before it becomes something that you have to um, it's not the word argue about but you have to defend and so that you bring it up, you initiate it, and knowing how to have that conversation to do that is really, really critical. If that's important to that person, it may not even be relevant or important until you ask questions and ask questions and then ask some more questions, you won't know. So on a practical side of things, I think what you're talking about is um, like overcoming objections either before they become objections mm. or um, as they become objections. And I noticed that a lot of um, entrepreneurs, especially people who have um, online courses or online sales pages and that sort of thing, they often have the FAQs, which is a, mm-hmm. like obviously a cool way of almost answering those objections or can, or questions before they kind of even come up. Is that the sort of thing that you're That's the sort of thing well? I'm talking about. And online you don't get the opportunity to have a conversation and that, so that's what you need to do with that. So if you're in a sales conversation and you know your story in your head is that, oh, I'm too expensive, they won't buy from me, and you do know that price is a, a point of, you know, an important factor of their decision making. You actually have found that out by asking the questions and asking them the right way. Is that when you go into that conversation, you could say something like, "Look, when I go, when I've had these conversations with companies exactly like yours in the past, sometimes the first thing they're thinking of is about how much it's going to cost." Whereas once they've had a look at it and really delved deep and realised the value in it, that the cost is still relevant, but when they weigh it up against the value, it's, they can see that that's not the first thing they should be looking at. So you can see how powerful that is because you've brought it up and you've directed it in a way that, well, oh, my gosh, I should be thinking of value. You've already right. presupposed the person is going to think like this. Mm. They've put it in, in their they're thinking, okay, so I del- delete that pricing's an issue. Mm. That's really, really clever. I really like, um, I really like that. And I, I guess it's a confidence thing to a certain extent and it's sort mm. of a trial and error and you've got to, you know, have these conversations and try them out before you yes. get totally comfortable with them usually. So 
Another question I have is um, I've put my prices up, I think, three or four times now, most recently about two weeks ago, um, mm-hmm. and I put them up as like a, my hourly rate has gone up. And every time I put my rates up, it's definitely gotten easier and I've felt less guilt about it and less hang-ups and less like I haven't, I don't feel like I have to have this, you know, three-month lead that I've got to tell everyone. I can just say, next week my prices are going up. Like I don't have to apologise for it sort of thing. Mm. But Mm. it has been a massive block and I know it's a really big block for people, especially in the first year or two of their business because you're still kind of struggling with that worth and um, you want to be... um, Uh, cheap enough or you know low price enough so that you're accessible so that you're getting lots of new people through the door so that you're building your credibility and your referral and your networks and all that sort of thing but also you know I've heard it said that the fastest way to start resenting your gift is to do it for free or to do it Mm, for too cheap and I know I've definitely been in that place where I've really started to resent my business and my clients and the work that I'm doing because I'm just not charging enough for it. And I'm thinking, mm. why am I up at midnight when I'm only charging 50 bucks an hour or something like I might as well go and work at Coles and I'll probably be earning the same for this sort of, you know, mm. this sort of um, hours of work and whatnot. So any kind of um, tips around that sort of thing? Cause I think it's quite a, um, an important thing is that price point. And especially when you're a solopreneur that, um, you know, to make it balance out with all the hours that you do and that sort of thing, you do often have a higher hourly rate than what you might get um, elsewhere. So, yeah, any sort of tips on the mindset and the uh, process and the practicalities of pricing? Uh, that's a whole lot of really good points in there because exactly right, a lot of people do start off at that lower rate and that's a, that's a good part of the discussion as well because it is that start-off rate. The... and part of the getting comfortable with whatever it is is what you're comfortable with i really um get frustrated with these presenters that go you know that say i used to charge fifty dollars an hour i now charge ten thousand and get you know the top line customers and that's what you should be doing as well well it's not you know the people that the people that i personally like to work with that i choose to work with can't afford that so you know, to me, to put prices at that level means that, it, as you said, it's not accessible to them. But again, I want a level that's for my that is for my worth and the value that I offer. So the the price points I've chosen for me fits that, and I think that's the best way to to give that. You know, for anyone to do that is to say, okay, what do I need to be now? But what exactly what you're doing? What do I need to have as my price point that I value myself and I respect myself at this level. And if I do, then others will as well. Uh, Yeah, I think that's so, that's exactly what it is. It's really about um, kind of standing in your own truth and and not, um, you can't be all things to everyone. Mm -hmm. And I know um, I still have a tendency to, you know, when I send off a proposal or a quote or something, I still have this, urge and this kind of hesitation before I send it like oh maybe I should just drop a hundred dollars off or maybe I should add an extra couple of hours or maybe I should add uh, you know I'm trying to work out how to give even more value and then I think come on just let's just break it down a bit again but it's a really big kind of block because Mm. I think that um you know that kind of block that people have around their worth and asking for money and I don't know if it's particularly um a thing that's more prevalent in women that we you know, um, have to be in that space of receiving and being open to receiving to kind of have that um, okayness with asking for a certain amount of money. Um, And maybe that's just a bit of a a practice and a trial and error kind of situation that you've really got to go through that process until you get totally comfortable with it. Um, Do you see me nodding? Yeah. Yeah. It's, (laughs) yeah. yeah. (laughs) Look, I've got two grown sons and they work in construction and one in particular keeps moving from company to company and getting more and more skills and getting higher placed jobs. And at the moment he's got 350 staff running a $150 million job Mm. and he's 33. So he's worked his way through. He just asks for it. Yeah. He just goes to the next company and says, "This is I'm going to work hard this, and I'll work long hours, but this is what I want to get paid. Mm. And he has no hesitation in, in doing that whatsoever. I, um, I used to work in recruitment and HR and I remember um, something I read one day that said something like, uh, say if you're looking at a job ad on Seek or whatever, 
that uh, women won't even apply for a job unless they feel like they meet at least 85% of the skills and um, experience that's required in that job ad. Men only have to feel they meet 15% of it. Really? That's they've, just, they've, they've just got the, the, um, the guts or the confidence or the arrogance maybe, I don't know, to yeah. just go... I'm not qualified. I don't have the experience, but I'm going to go for it anyway. And um, as a result, like every time I see statistics about women having lower pay grades and lower promotion rates and all that sort of thing, I think it's got something to do with that because mm. we kind of think this, oh no, they won't take us seriously. I you won't even send my resume. Whereas, you know, having worked in recruitment, I know that I used to always favor recruiting for um, personality and motivation and those kind of key um, traits rather than their experience. You can teach skills. You can't mm. teach perseverance, resilience, agility, um, teamwork, all that sort of thing. You can't teach that stuff. I mean, mm. you probably can, but it's not as inherent if you don't, if you don't already have it. I'd mm. rather have someone who was straight out of school and had no idea what they were doing that had a great attitude and was open to learning and was a great team player and all that sort of thing than mm. someone who'd been, you know, doing it for 20 years who had a shitty attitude. So yeah. no, um, I, I think it's really interesting. Yeah, yeah it is. And, yeah. and um, yeah, you said we, that I found that really interesting that women's 80% and men are 15%. And that's because we, well, we might be a fraud and, you know, it, we, we found out to be a fraud if we can't do something. And, women tend to judge women a lot more harshly than they judge men as well. And I don't know, is it our mothers that have done it to us and their mothers and their mothers? I don't know where it comes from, but it, it is. And when you're coming into that sales conversation, it's exactly the same. You know, I, they might think I'm a fraud. You know, I'm not as good as somebody else. Or, but, but we've got to believe that we are, especially when we're going out in business for ourselves that we've got a ton to offer. And that's one of the biggest things that I focus on in my workshops, that there's, there's a system. And the first part is to step into your own into your own self, you know, really step out of the comfort zone and step into yourself and then own your personal power. Because there's no use teaching sales. All of the tips and techniques and all of the profiling, everything, there's no use teaching any of that until you own your own stuff. I absolutely love it. It's, it is such a fundamental thing. And I think it's, again, I think all of this is part of a process. Like I don't think there's too many people who walk in and say, I'm going to start my own business and they completely know the direction they're going in and they completely know how much they're going to charge and they completely own how amazing they are. And, and I, something that's been really kind of fundamental to my learning, I think, is that I don't have to know everything, but there are people who are three to five years behind me who I can offer stuff to. There's people who are three or five years in front of me and they don't need to learn from me. I need to learn from them. They're not my dream client. They're not the people who are going to work with me and I'm okay with that. But in the start, I thought, oh, well, you know, if I don't know as much as those people, then why would anyone work with me? But mm. you have, you've totally got, I, I have a um, six week online course called Pause for Effect. And the second module is called All of You, which right. is about, um, it's almost like collating your, uh, your CV, like from your business and your experience, your personal life, like everything that's happened until now that you could potentially be bringing to the table in your business, whether it's internal or for your clients. And kind of pulling all that together. Because remember when we used to go for jobs and you'd do your CV and you'd tell them how great you were and you'd put all these beautiful keywords around how you were a team player and you were perseverant and you were um, a thought leader and you were a problem solver and all that sort of thing. And mm -hmm. you had seven years of experience in this and 20 years of experience in this. And then we go into our own businesses and we're like, oh, I don't want anyone to know I used to do that stuff. Oh, no, that's, <laughs> that's, not, a, that's not a thing I do now. Like I, I have, have so many different lives. Every time I talk to someone, they're like, oh, I didn't know you did that. I didn't know you did that because I've got, you know, lots of experience. Yeah. And there's some of it that I used to be a little bit, um, I don't know if embarrassed is the right word, but I just didn't think it was relevant. So I didn't talk about it. But when I talk, when I kind of delve into it and go, actually, these are all the skills and experiences and interactions and things that I learned from that. Why wouldn't I bring that to the table? Like, why wouldn't I put all of that together? Because all of the things that have happened have gotten me to where I'm at now. Even things outside of my career, like having children, buying a house, traveling, like all of that sort of thing has stuff that I can offer 
my business and my clients. Mm, I t absolutely, totally agree. I wrote, I've written a book on, it's called Good Girls Do Sell and the tagline is The Modern Businesswoman's Guide to Authentic Selling. Love and it. I've got lots of my stories in it and I very much like you, I started in, I started in a cut price store, which is, the, I don't know whether they exist anymore, but it's like a local IGA type of thing and, and left school at 15 with the intention of going back and being becoming a teacher and then I got paid $37 a week. There was no way in the world I was going back to school ever again. It was incredible money for, I know, it's a long time ago, okay? Wow. <laughs> it, was, it was super exciting. And, and again, yeah, you're thinking that, you know, you, as you said, best and less and working in that environment. But, my gosh, the learning from that environment as a 15-year-old, mm. I would never have got that teaching at school, not yeah. at all, you know, and... And that's sort of carried me through with everything that I've done and, and now at the level that I am now to be able to, you know, teach others to, to, to do what they can do and to be their authentic selves, their real selves. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, but, yeah, it starts way back, way back then. Just, yeah. Yeah, and, and I've, you know, I've got stories of being bullied by the boss and things like that, but that just stood me in, in you know, it made me stronger and better and you move yeah. on to the next position yeah. it does the same. Hashtag trust the process. It's totally, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. And like, I think the same thing. And, you know, I used to get the, sh the shits when people would be so um, uh, derogatory and so insulting to me because I was still in retail or I was just in retail and that sort of thing. And, you know, the, the most recent retail job I had, I was managing three stores in a flagship capacity, three, three stores. I think we had a, a management team of about 10 staff of about 80 and we we're turning over 11 or 12 million dollars a year like no mm. i'm not just working in a shop because i'm too stupid to go to university or something mm. and the business stuff that i learned and had to um, manage and have control and have relationships and all that sort of thing like you don't you just don't learn that anywhere mm. else really well, i shouldn't say anywhere else but it was amazing like i um had such incredible um experience and and connections and that sort of thing and I, like you you know from a really young age I was earning pretty good money you know I, I think when I was working my first retail management job after I finished uni or after I stopped uni I was earning like $28,000 a year which at the time I was like what someone's paying me $28,000 a year <laughs> right you know by the end I was earning almost 90,000 for yeah. um, you know there I've worked in London in like the flagship store of Gap right on Oxford Street, the flagship of Europe, you know, with the exposure that that sort of place had was amazing. Yeah. Um, and being part yeah. of it, such a massive machine that's got 800 people in it. And like, it's just a crazy thing to do. But mm -hmm. people really had this kind of thing like, oh, oh still in retail, I, are you? So I know. And that's one of the oh, things yeah. I have about, you know, this push towards um, everyone. Every Everyone has to go to university. Every child in the school has to go to university. You know, and my, as I said, my son is 33 in construction, earning over $250,000 a year. Yeah. And, you know, works hard for the money, but he's, and he's responsible for 100 50 million dollar job and he he's done two trades and he yeah. worked in a cafe from 16 and oh, he does great food prep as well you know <laughs> it's like you know he can cook really good stuff but it's life skills it's that's what it's about it's it, it's what we're good at and this is you know um you know, obviously both you and i are good at building connections with people and having conversations and, and really trying to help people and find out what their needs are and what we can do and what we can offer to a system and that's what sales is all about that's not trying to sell anything to anybody it's all about finding out a way of what you can offer can help somebody else i love it so my my last question and you've just answered one of them my last question is what three takeaways or what three things can people do to start selling in a way that doesn't feel gross to them and obviously, like you've said, is about the relationship and about finding a way to articulate your journey and therefore what you know and what you're good at and what your experience is and how you can help other people is number one. What other, what other couple of things would be the top? And just, top just adding to that too, but being able to listen, ask more questions and listen rather mm. than talk as well. That's, that's yeah. really, really vital and, and listening to how people say things and what they say. Um, I think one of the things that we need to give ourselves a break is there's a few reasons people won't buy from us. 
sometimes they just don't need what you've got. You know, that's a really biggie and just don't... Look, if you're not going skiing, there's a good chance you won't need snow boots. You know, really good chances. So there are things that people just don't need and most of the time they don't buy from you because they don't see value in what they, you offer and they don't, don't trust you yet. Go back to point number one. You know, that's, it all comes around. And just wrecking, and I know we haven't even touched on this yet, but uh, something that I do with the personality profiling is recognising that everyone is seeing the world differently than you are. So where you're sitting at this particular time is different than where somebody else is. So being able to understand their needs from their position rather than what you want to push out then is really vital as well. And it's all, mm. all that communication. I think that's really interesting. And, and um, you and I talked about this briefly before I hit record, but um, that's really sort of struck a chord for me. And, and something that I do, I talk a lot about content. I help a lot of people with their content planning. And often for every piece of um, content that you create or that someone creates, I suggest creating four other um, four sort of posts, like on social media, for example. So we do four different posts with a different question or a different angle that mm -hmm. will lead everyone back to that same piece of content, but it will pique different people's interest because we've used different keywords or different um, style of questioning or a different statement or something like that. So what you're saying is quite similar to that. So you might, um, you might have one thing that you're selling mm -hmm. and it might actually tick off excuse me, it might actually tick off three or four different pain points, but not everyone has all three or four of those pain points. They might just be trying to solve one. So you talk about one, you know, after the other so that they kind of maybe um, pick more people or pick, pick up more people rather than bombarding them with, or oh, we only fix this thing. We're actually, it's fixing a few other things, but you've got yeah. to kind of talk to the pain points a bit as well in the outcomes. That is um, difficult to do when you've got a one minute pitch. You really do need to focus on one pain, pain point. <laughs> Um, I, I also coach in professional presenting, so just oh, maybe yeah. about that topic as well. So if I've got somebody that's coming to me that's re so nervous that they they can't put, string their words together and they'll never speak in front of an audience, I have people that are high, fairly skilled and they just want to you know find out if they've they've never been evaluated. They've just gone out and presented. And nobody's ever told them how well they have done before and others just have a story and they don't care really how well they present it but they want to get that story out mm. so if I'm delivering a mark you know a marketing thing to them yes I need to be aware that I each one of those has got a different reason to come to me mm. but they'll all do the same course right right mm. Interesting. Because it'll answer all those needs. Yeah. But, um, I, until recently, I didn't really understand this sell them what they want, give them what they need concept. I always thought that sounds really dodgy. That I don't like the idea of that. I just want to sell them what they need. Like I don't want to, you know. But now I understand that it's really talking, it's using the same language and it's talking to the thing that they want, whether it's ego related or outcome related or money related or something like that. And then like you've got your own methodology and your own sort of process of going through to fix that pain point and to mm. get a good outcome. Um, and that's actually what it means, I think. So I think that's a really, a yeah. really cool one to remember. As yeah, well. exactly. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Awesome. Because, because you, and same as what you do with your clients, you know what works. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. But if you stood there and say, Hey, I'm the expert. I know it works. Just sit down and shut up. And just listen. trust me. That's sit down and trust me. <laughs> <laughs> it's not until, you know, I have clients I could do that with and you'd be the same. That would yeah. just trust you with everything now. If you tell them something, they'll trust you. Yes. But that takes a while to get there. It does. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show, Janine. It's been absolutely beautiful chatting with you. A very interesting and slightly different from the usual kind of um, conversation. It's very practical and definitely something that's massive in our industry in um, especially solo ladypreneurs um, getting over that kind of sales thing. And maybe we need to call it something different than sales. It's sales eventually, but it's really about relationship building and that no like, mm. and trust um, factor is massive. So that's beautiful. Yes. Thank you so Thank much. You very much. It's been fun. It's on the other side of the microphone is no, no. It's quite different. It's, it's, <laughs> it's great. As awesome. I think I told you I got interviewed on my own podcast the other Indeed. day quite a different experience as well. Very cool. And now, uh, Janine, where can people find you? We'll put your links and everything in show notes, obviously, but is there a easy place for people who, um, if they're interested to go and find you or find your book or anything like that? 
everything's on my website. So I've got lots of other social media things, but it's probably just easier to go to the website, which is speechperfect.com.au. And the, there's a calendar there that's got lists all of the, the training sessions, all of the workshops that are coming up, the books for sale on there. I've got the download, the podcast. I've got heaps of blogs as well. So wow. It's all happening. <laughs> Brilliant. Hours of fun. Hours of fun. <laughs> all right, Janine. Well, thanks very much again, and we'll be in touch soon. Loved it, Claire. Thanks a okay, lot. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. And that is absolutely it, my lovely. So I hope you've really enjoyed the episode. It was great fun recording that one, as it is with all of them. If you'd like to connect, I'd love to stay in touch with you. I have a beautiful Facebook group um, community at bit.ly forward slash The Recovering Perfectionist Crew with all um, capital T, R, P and C. I am also have a massive goal this year to get 50,000 downloads on my podcast and I've got a YouTube show as well. So I'd love for you to help me out if you can by either subscribing to the podcast on iTunes. So if you want to go over and do that now, that would be awesome. If you have a couple of favorite episodes or if there's one favorite episode that you've really enjoyed, I would love you to share that with anyone who you think would get as much out of it as you have as well. And while you're in iTunes, if you can jump in and give it a review, that would be amazing. iTunes definitely helps out podcasts that have got some some good ratings and reviews and some really interactive listeners. So I would really appreciate your help with getting to my goal of 50,000 in 2017. The show is also available over on YouTube. The links are always in the show notes, so you can um, head over there. So it's The Recovering Perfectionist on YouTube. There's a channel for that as well. So jump in and leave your comments. You can watch all of the episodes in video. So if you want to see what we look like and our crazy hand gestures and uh, facial expressions and all of that sort of thing, absolutely jump in. You can subscribe to the YouTube channel show as well and then you'll be kept up to date when there's some uh, new episodes that come in there. So yeah, love your support. And if you want to shoot me an email, it's hello at clairebarton.com.au. Always happy to receive your emails and, yeah, open up a conversation. All right, big love. I'll chat with you soon. Bye.